So everybody, let's say you finally stepped up from $50 to $100 shoes with bonded on soles to a real Goodyear welted leather shoe, and you get something that you're not sure if it's a flaw or not. This video is gonna help you determine if it's actually not a flaw, if it is a flaw, and it's something that's easily fixable, or if you should return it. Okay, so let's go. Hello everybody, it's Robert Powers. Four and a half out of My five. My shoe collection. These are made of shell cord. Yeah, here they are finished up. I'm not a professional. Look how tight this is though. Very clearly here, I just cut the thread in half. And here they are, all finished up. Now first, let me give you the premise for this video. What I'm talking about is generally people who have purchased in the past what I would call a cheap shoe, usually have cheap materials, and the hallmark of these cheap shoes are, even though it looks like it may be stitched, these shoes generally have bonded on uh, rubber soles. Uh, or something like this, where this one, if it's hard to see here, but those aren't actually stitches, it's just molded in. This is a one-piece rubber sole, and the whole thing is just glued together. If you're stepping up from that, to something like an Allen Edmonds that actually has a real 360 degree Goodyear welted sole, leather sole, uh, and also has full grain leather uppers or something like this Allen Edmonds McAllister. Sometimes what I'm noticing is especially, I've seen a lot of posts, a ton of them on Reddit, uh, especially in the r slash uh, Allen Edmonds thread uh, on Reddit, uh, you know, that's a subreddit, where they're asking, is this a problem? You know, is this something that should be returnable? So I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna show you several different levels of perceived problems in Goodyear welted shoes, okay? So first of all, I think what you need to understand is the four categories that I'm gonna go through. I'm gonna go through number one, this is actually not a problem. Uh, number two, it's minor, you can just fix that yourself. Uh, number three, it's minor, but you know, you may want to return it. Or number four, this is major, definitely return it, okay? So the first area that I'm going to talk about is patina and dyeing issues in new Goodyear welted shoes. So what is patina? Patina, uh, my definition of patina is a change in color of a natural material due to uh, age, weathering, and time. So in a shoe, what patina means is when you add a patina, you're adding coloring that looks as if it's natural, as if it's aged. So what you see here are a pair of Allen Edmonds strands, my strands. They come with a very mild patina. If you look closely around the eye stays and also on the tips of the toes, there's a little bit of burnishing. That's the darkening. Okay, that's absolutely normal. Now, if you look at the side of the shoe, you can see there is darkening again at the tip of the toe, around the eye stays. This is the way it comes and along the sides of the shoe. This is how it should look. Remember, number one, this is full grain leather if you're talking about almost all Allen Edmonds and most high-end shoes. A full grain leather basically means you are seeing the actual hide of the animal. It's not coated with an artificial material like most cheaper shoes are. With most cheaper shoes like these, uh, lower grade Johnson and Murphys, what you're seeing here is a plastic coating that's not actually the surface of the leather. This is corrected grain leather. Let's look at another one here. Uh, this is a pair of Park Avenues that I purchased. Again, you see that minor variation in color darkening around the toes. That's the way it should be. Here's another view of the same shoes. Again, around the eye stays, the tips of the toes, and then sometimes around the sides of the vamp. Now here's one, this is actually the same pair of strands. If you see at the back of the shoe there, can you see there is a darkened area? Now, that's actually not a problem. Although you may not like it, let me tell you something. Now, what I'm gonna say next is my opinion, just the opinion of this dude here, okay? I'm gonna make an analogy. Um, I'm probably gonna tick some people off by using this analogy. And if I had any shot of Allen Edmonds Corporation, uh, you know, maybe sending me free product or do, letting me do something for them, I'm probably about to blow that, you know, right out of the water, but here it goes. Back in the day when I used to work on cars before I had kids, um, I had a good transmission guy. Um, one of my favorite cars that I had for a while was, it was actually a 1984 Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme, bench seat, column shift, uh, that was my first Cutlass. It had a decent 350 in it, you know, warmed over stock 350, dual exhaust. And I had a turbo 700, not 204R, 700R4 transmission built for it. And that transmission had the shift kit, blocked accumulator, you know, a lot of the goodies in it, uh, higher stall converter. So basically what would happen is if you'd hold it in first gear while you're going down the road, rev it up to about four grand, let off the gas, pop it into second gear, brah, it would chirp the tires awesome full throttle one two shifted lay five feet of rubber it was beautiful right 
why the heck am I telling you this? I had a guy that would set up the transmissions that way. He worked at a professional transmission shop, but he also did side work at home, and I got to know him personally. So I funneled some of my friends to him. Uh, this guy, Dave, though, great human being. But there was one thing about him that sometimes I learned I had to warn my friends. If you caught him later in the evening or just happened to catch him at the wrong time, how do I say this politically correctly? Sometimes when you caught him outside of work, he'd already pounded a few down, if you know what I'm saying. Like he'd already may have a half a case or a case of beer in him. And he may not have always made the greatest first impression, even though like I never actually had a real problem for the most part with his work. And maybe one or two times I had a problem, you know, he fixed it for me and made everything right. What's my point? I think Alan Edmonds is kind of like that. You know, maybe you have an uncle that you invite to the Christmas parties like, hey, by the way, he's a good dude. But my opinion, Alan Edmonds is kind of like that. They have a unique niche in the market. I don't think there's anybody else that has the following things. I've done a full video on this. I'll link in the description or right here. Alan Edmonds is one of the only shoe companies I know of that number one, where you can buy a Goodyear welted full grain leather upper shoe, right? A real Goodyear welted full grain leather upper shoe. They have physical stores where you can try on the shoes and they have narrow, extra narrow, wide and extra wide widths. You can have a lot of other companies which may have two or three or one of those features, but I don't know of anybody else that does all of that. And what I would call Allen Edmonds, even though most of their dress shoes are three hundred ninety-five dollars, uh, you know, in that range, full retail price, you know, the, it, to me, it's really about a two hundred and fifty to three hundred dollars shoe, you know, because they have sales so often, right? To me, Allen Edmonds is kind of like Joseph A. Banks. You know, I generally don't buy any other stuff full price. I'm going to wait for some kind of sale. Okay. I've bought new first quality, not second quality, not defect shoes, new first quality shoes, uh, $315, $245. I've got a pair of uh, McNeil's I bought for $225. And I even have a pair of Atchison's you'll see here that I paid $97 for a new first quality. Okay. So when you see the, the some of these things that you may perceive as a problem, my point is this. I guess there's been in recent years, again, my opinion, not a fact, some rise in quality concerns. But you know what? The materials they use, this is not something that has acrylic applied to it where the entire batch is going to look the same, right? This is real full grain leather. And they're applying by hand these uh, burnishings and these patinas. So there's more steps in these shoes, like in the finishing and in the coloring and the cutting of the soles and et cetera, et cetera. And they're also doing it from uh, non-standard materials. I did a leather talk interview with uh, Phil Callis, who owns Ashland Leather Company. He works or worked at uh, Horween Tannery where they produced leather. And he said, leather is a unique thing. You're trying to get a consistent end result from an inconsistent raw material. Remember, these were living creatures, right? So what you have when you have these kinds of shoes, this is a real leather outsole. And this is the actual, right, the skin of the animal. You're actually seeing what was the, the outside of the hide of the animal. You're not seeing a layer of plastic covering something. You're seeing a real leather sole with real stitches, not something that either has bonded in, you know, like, um, I'm sorry, not something that has a molded in stitches or, you know, a artificial material with fake stitches. Those aren't real stitches. Those stitches don't attach to the top side, okay? So you're dealing with these natural materials, much more variation, many more steps. And therefore you have a lot more variables and you just have a lot more chance for errors to happen and many more steps involved for errors to happen, right? So it's just a higher level of skill and it is getting harder to find skilled labor to stick, especially through the COVID pandemic era. So that's why if you get something really minor like that, I hate to say it this way, but if you really want that perfection, you're not gonna get it for a couple $300 right? You're probably going to have to move up to like the Alden level or, you know, some of those four or $500 shoes or Cobbler Union or, you know, there's dozens of other brands out there, you know, $400 and up that rarely, or if, uh, you know, don't ever give discounts. So if you want to stay in that 250 to $300 range, you know, um, I really think it's a wonderful, wonderful bargain. Uh, the Wisconsin shoe guy said something about Allen Edmonds that I think is really true. He said, Allen Edmonds isn't so much concerned with how the shoe looks. I'm paraphrasing what he said here. He said, they're more concerned with the longevity of it. Something like this, where you see a little patina is not quite faded correctly. That has nothing to do with the longevity of the shoe. Okay. So they're more concerned with things that actually affect the longevity of the shoe versus things that make it look hundred percent pretty. 
So my books, that's not a problem. Now here's another one. You see the darkened area is probably a little darker than you might like it. So I would say it's not a problem, but if this bothers you, if you've done some of this kind of stuff before, here's my impression with Allen Edmund shoes. With Allen Edmund shoes, the base color is applied, then they apply the burnishing those darkened areas. With Saphir Reno Matte, Reno Matte is a solvent. I think it, my experience generally takes off that burnishing, like if you have a darkened toe on an Allen Edmonds, it'll take off that burnishing, but not the base color. So it could be something you fix yourself if you wanna apply a patina, which I've done in a bunch of my videos. Otherwise, if it really bothers you, if it bothers you, send it back, right? Um, I would advise though, before you really uh, wear an Allen Edmonds shoe and crease it, in other words, don't flex the toe. Wear it around the house, but do not, see that right there, don't bend it. You can walk and lift your feet up, wearing for an hour, but do two things. Number one, don't bend or break the shoe. Number two, uh, is do not stand on any hard material, only stand on carpeting. That way you'll preserve the leather sole and then you can return it and it'll look exactly the same as it was shipped to you, okay? So don't be that doofus that wears them on concrete for one day then tries to return them, you know what I mean? Just chews up the profits of the company and they can't resell the shoe, right? Here's another one. You can see here uh, the crazing across the cap toe and that is maybe because the shoe Maybe it was the way it dried too quickly or, uh, you know, where the, 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 the coloring of the surface didn't dry properly. Or maybe it was stepped on or smushed when they were packaging them or something like that or, you know, somewhere between the manufacturing and shipping. Uh, but to me, this one is very minor. You can fix it yourself. If it really bothers you, you can return it. But I think with this, you just use some, like in this case, the base color shoe is a medium brown. The burnishing is a darker brown. I'd use a medium or darker brown. Uh, cream polish, cream, not paste wax. Uh, to kind of fill in those little, you know, crevices there, those little, the little crazing. And then if you put a mirror shine on it, I'm telling you, you'll never even be able to see that crazing, okay? If you really want to be extreme, you could use that Saphir Reno Mat, strip off that burnishing and redo it with a, a Phoebing's dye that would penetrate the surface. But I think the average shoe person shouldn't have to do that. But so in my books, this could be fixed with polishing. No big deal. If it really bothers you, you're not handy. Yeah, you could return it. Let's talk about some construction and finishing issues. First of all, here's a pair of McNeil's that I bought uh, and wound up actually returning. So I'm not sure if you can see what's going on. So can you see the line of stitching? This is the top side of the welt where the yellow line is tracing is the stitching on the top side actually went off the edge of the welt. So let me show you another view here because this is a really major flaw. So you can see those grooves, that is where when they ground, they finish ground the outside of the sole, uh, it went and exposed the stitching. So the stitching basically fell off the edge of the sole. I didn't notice this when I first got the shoes. So after walking around for a few days where that stitching was broken, the sole separated from the welt and you could see that gap forming. So what I did with these shoes is I actually sent them back uh, and I had the shoes, uh, they put a new welt uh, and new soles on them free of charge, okay? So I did get the shoes back a couple few weeks later. That's documented in a video. Here's the bottom side of the sole. So you can see the black thread is the top thread. The brown one is the bottom thread. If you see this, I would return it. That's a thread tension problem, in this case caused by the aforementioned stitches running off the welt. But if you see something like this, the stitches aren't holding tight, that could become a problem. I would return that, okay? Now let's zoom in on this one here. What well, this is actually is just a little piece of leather or something or thread uh, that got caught under the stitching. This to me is a very minor, just grab a pair of needle nose pliers and just carefully pull it out. That's not a returnable problem in my books, okay? Now, here's a couple problems with the welting. This to me though is actually either not a problem or if it bothers you, you could fix it yourself. So what you're seeing here is the edge of the leather welt just got smushed. Now remember, most of the cheap shoes, that's gonna be a molded piece of plastic. That's why it's perfect every time. This is an actual piece of leather, okay? And the leather is pliable. So all you do here is just wet it down with a Q-tip. If this were the sole, I'd just take some sort of smooth, I would probably take uh, like, um, you could even use a tip of a pen or like a tip of a chopstick and just take it this way and just smooth down that leather rib while the welt is wet, and that should put that back into the proper shape, okay? 
Now, do you see here, this is actually a 2001 made Allen Edmonds, so don't go thinking, oh, it's only the new shoes that had problems. This pair is like from the golden era, okay? Do you see the line of stitching and do you see that groove? The line of stitching did not fall within the groove, right? So um, even though it's not preferable to me that it's, you know, not actually a problem, it's not gonna hurt anything, okay? So especially in this case, if it's on the arch where you don't walk, not a problem at all. Let's talk about leather scuffs and scratches and cuts. So first of all, let's talk about uh, um, uh, full grain leather again. Corrected grain leather, it's gonna be pretty perfect out of the box every time because you're looking at plastic. And it's also pretty impervious to scratching. Now, if you have full grain leather though, watch. You know, you can put, I don't know if you can't see, but you can put a mark there. You can put a mark on it just by dragging your fingernail across it. Well, but the thing is, it also goes away pretty easily too. You just, you know, put a little polish on it. 99% of these go away with just some cream polish that's the right color. If you're not sure, you know, a lighter color like this, you can get neutral or, or like a, you know, this would be walnut or light brown. Just get the appropriate matching color. If you're not sure, go too light, not too dark. Okay. But 99% of these, you just put one light coat of wax or pay, I'd start with cream polish, right? Saphir or my favorite brand is Pure Polish Products, Pure Polish Products. And that stuff just goes away, right? Because remember, because remember the leather again, full grain leather, natural material, it's more absorbent. That's why it lets your foot breathe better. That's also one of the reasons it lasts like decades instead of just a few years, you know, with the cheap leather. But you're going to get those little marks and stuff on them, right? Well, you're just not used to a shoe being made from a natural material. That's the problem. We're used to this artificial stuff. You know, nature is not perfect monotone in one color, okay? Now, here's another one. Let's look at this scuff right here. Let me zoom in on it. Now, can you see the black part of that scuff? If the scuff is dug into the leather, like if there is surface removed or if there's something deposited on top of it, like in this case, I'm guessing it's hard to tell from the picture if something black rubbed up against the upper, then in that case, if you're not handy, you might want to return it. Because the problem is you go trying to fix it and you screw it up, you know, and you're not handy, you're going to be in trouble. So in other words, if this were me, I would first take some cream polish and try and polish it out. The solvents in the cream polish might be enough to lift the black off. If that didn't work, I would probably use some Reno Matte. Here's a tip, Reno Matte. It may take off the surface finish, like I said, of the burnishing especially. Test on the tongue, okay? Test any solvents you're gonna use on the tongue because that way if it lightens up the finish or, or messes it up, you're not gonna see it. Test it on the edge of the tongue. But I would take a little bit of that Reno mat on a rag, and I would probably take that black off. Then pop, I just poke myself in the eye. I, I'd take a little bit of uh, um, Reno mat on a rag, just hit that black area, lift that off, and then use some cream polish if it lightens that area back up to darken it and blend it back in. Okay. So like I said, I would only return that if you just are a completely hands-off kind of person and you're not handy at all. You know, you may not want to touch that and make it worse. Now this one, do you see if you zoom in on this? This is actually not a scuff or a scratch. This is actually a cut in the leather, especially if this, this is not shell cordovan, but if it's cordovan, but especially if it was shell cordovan. It's cut like this, especially where this one is. This right here along the flex point of the vamp there, the side of the vamp, I guess I'd say, I would definitely return that. The reason is because that cut is deep enough, it's weak in the leather, that's in a high stress area, and I would see that splitting open over time, and then you're really screwed, okay? So that one I'd definitely return. Now here to me, it looks like somebody might have pinned something through the shoes, astounding as that is. Um, you have every right to return the shoe, obviously, but you know what, if you get a good Allen Edmonds shoe and that's the only problem, moisten that down just a little bit. You could just use some water or moisturizing cream. Again, take, again, take like even the end of this thing, something blunt, round and smooth, you know, like plastic or wood. Believe it or not, you just moisten that down and just back it like with your thumb or something and just rub that leather. And I'm telling you that will close right up and you'll almost be imperceptible. That's very easy. It'll take three minutes yourself to take care of, okay? Because that leather, that opening will close back up, especially if you dampen it and then it dries that way, okay? Now, this is the pair of McAllister's uh, that I actually have here and I just showed you a minute ago. Uh, the left left picture and the second from the left picture is the same shoe. It's not really very obvious here, but the surface finish was a little bit rough. And then the right two pictures, again, left before, right after. Um, I didn't polish the edges very well, but it is smoother on the right picture. What I did was I just took some, I think, the, you know, like a, a 220 grit sandpaper and I sanded those sides down. 
to get rid of some of the bumpiness. I just felt like they didn't smooth the edges of the heels as well. Again, that's not a functionality issue. That is a curb appeal issue, okay? And sometimes you're going to get that of Allen Edmonds, where you can see the tool marks, you know, the finishing is a little bit rougher, you know, compared to some high-end shoes you get where the heels are just glossy like glass, okay? So uh, that... I would say it's not a problem, or if it bothers you, just fix it yourself, especially if the edges of the heels are black. You can literally just use, uh, after you sand it, to recolor it, because if you sand it, oftentimes you'll sand through the black color. You can literally use like the edge dressing you use, you know, like you use edge dressing on the edge of the heels. You can just use that to recolor it and then we wax it. Now, do you see here, there is a little piece of flashing just where they sand it and then they didn't take that. You know, like I said, some people get freaked out about that because they don't see that. Well, yeah, of course, this is an injection molded shoe that, you know, they pop out thousands of these a day out of an injection mold. Yeah, they're not going to have those kind of problems. But here you're having a heel block right there. What you're seeing is this shoe has one piece. All this is one piece of rubber. Right there, what you're looking at is a welt, you're seeing an outsole, you're seeing a heel block, you're seeing that rubber piece on top of the heel block, and you're seeing a top lift, where the cheap shoe has one part, this has five, oh, plus the top and bottom stitching, so you could really say seven parts is what you're seeing, okay? So it's just much more complicated to put together, the operator missed a little piece of flashing. If it really bothers you, take an X-Acto knife, utility knife, just carefully pop that off of there, or take a piece of sandpaper and sand it off, okay? 30 seconds and you're done. Here's something else I'm going to talk about. Loose grain. What is loose grain? Well, let me show you what loose grain is. First of all, the, sh the uh, leather that the shoe uppers are cut from, okay? Generally speaking, what you have is the kind of like, you know, I believe they open up the animal from the middle. So you have this hide that's opened up. So where usually the best leather, my understanding is like low on the back, middle of the back is where the best leather is. You get to the belly and that's where the loosest leather is going to be. Just like, well, you know, some of us that are older, right? The, you know, skin around our belly is looser. Okay. So sometimes what's happened here is they're cutting or clicking. It used to be called clicking. They're cutting the leather uppers. Whoever's the clicker cutting these, you know, upper materials out. Use the leather that's too far from the good spot. And they got what's called loose grain, or the leather is loose. So you can see here my pair of Atchison's. This is a pair of Atchison's I bought new. They're not factory seconds. Uh, and I bought them for $97 from Allen Edmonds. And the uh, right shoe, which is on your left, is perfect. But you see how wrinkled the left shoe on your right is. That's loose grain. Let me show you some other examples. By the way, this, it's either you're going to just live with it. And I did because they're 97. If I had paid $297, you better believe I would be returning the shoes. Okay, but for 97 bucks, I must use them as not like kind of like a beater, but I keep these shoes by the door sometimes without shoe trees in them. And I pop them on when I'm going out to the store, you know, so I kind of beat them up a little bit. So this to me is either live with it or return it. There's no in between. There's no fixing it. You cannot moisturize that out. So the left one here, I would say is not a problem. It's minor enough, in my opinion. Uh, I would live with it, you know, especially if I bought them on sale for under 250 bucks. Uh, the right one though, to me, uh, you know, and this person actually posted and read it and said that was after one, one wear, especially when the uh, other shoe doesn't match, uh, definitely to me is a return it. That's just plain loose grain. They shouldn't have cut uh, the area. They shouldn't have used that area of upper material for the vamp, okay? Let's look at incomplete die cutting. I don't know if you can tell, but right there, right? Remember the whole dangling Chad thing, the voter thing? So you see that circle? This is a brogue hole in my McAllister's. It wasn't punched all the way through enough uh, to have that pop out. Again, that small hole on this side of the shoe, to me, not a problem, just let it go. You could try and pull it out, but if it doesn't come out very easily, I would leave it because what happens is that hole, uh, there's leather underneath it. And if it didn't get punched all the way through and you try to cut it, you could risk damaging the layer underneath. You know, so for most people, I would leave it alone. Now you see here though, the medallion on the toe cap. Do you see, there's a couple things going on. Number one, that hole didn't get punched through. But number two, the piece is kind of a little bit jagged. And number three, it looks like there's a little bit of scuffing or something around that hole. Uh, even though that is fairly minor, if that bothered you, uh, you know, you would have every right to return it. It's just that if you tried to fix that yourself, you don't know how deep or shallow that uh, hole has been die cut and you might make it worse. You know, so that one, you know, I would either live with it or more likely this, I would say return it. 
Now I've saved the best one for last and this is the one that comes up the most, the welt joint, right? Well, first of all, the first question you might be asking, what is a welt joint? Okay, well, I have some visual aids here to show you. I have a pair of uh, kilted tassel loafers that I cut apart, okay? So I have a whole other video on this. I will link here and in the description below. This folks right here, this strip of leather is the welt. And I don't know if you can tell, but it usually starts, it usually starts, uh, I think it usually starts on the inside of the sh inside of the shoe near the heel. But this is one strip of leather that goes all the way around the shoe. That's why they call this 360 degree Goodyear welted. Okay. There are shoes that the welt only goes three quarters of the way around where it does not wrap around the heel. That's called 270 degree Goodyear welted. Many English shoes are that way. A lot of Johnson and Murphys are done that way. The older Johnson and Murphys. So, but let me show you the function of the welt. So this is the shoe cut in half. So this is the outsole. Okay. This is the insole that your foot rests on. You see the layer of cork is in between. This is the welt right there. That piece is the welt. So what happens is this rib, this little angled piece, that rib right there. Let me show you that. That's this right here. Do you see the white stuff? That's the gemming. There's the rib. Okay, this is glued to the insole. So what you have now is a cloth piece with a solid rib sticking out. Okay, there's the same thing. That is the rib and that's the cloth piece bonding it to the insole. This is the gemming. So what happens is now you have a rib sticking down. This is the shoe upper, the upper, the gemming, and the welch. There is a stitch that goes through here. That holds the welt to the gemming and the upper. Now that gives you this welt going all the way around the shoe. That's what lets you stitch the outsole to. The welt is what the outsole stitches are attached to. Now, why did I go through all that to show you that? Well, the welt has to join somewhere. Now, it was actually really hard to find in this shoe, but the welt joint on this one, do you see it's right there? That is an excellent welt joint. I mean, that welt joint is done so well, you know, it took me a long time to find it with the shoe torn apart. You get the idea, okay? So that's a perfect welt joint. So the point is that all these shoes have to have a welt joint. Well, why don't you have that problem on these shoes? Because they don't have a welt, do you understand? Okay, so uh, the first one here, this is not a problem. Can you see the welt? Yes. Is that a problem? Absolutely not. Do you see? It's on the inside of the shoe above the heel, the most inconspicuous place. Here's another one. This one is a storm welt. You see the lip turned up? That's actually a pretty good job. That is not a problem. That is a normal welt. Now here's another one. Now this one's not as pretty. The welt joint isn't terrible, but you can also see from the, uh, this is like a crepe sole, I think, or anyway, it's a more of a boot type uh, outdoorsy sole. Uh, you know, so this is not as high end of a shoe. It's not as dressy of a shoe, but can you see the stitching? They kind of doubled over, you know, so the operator probably could have stopped the outsole stitcher two or three stitches prior, but so that's why you see some of uh, the doubled over stitching, but this is not a problem, okay? That's totally fine. Functionally, 100% fine. Again, that bothers you, go spend 100 to $200 more on something, you know, higher end. Here's another one. You see the welt joint there? Again, not a problem. Can you see it? Yes, but functionally, it is 100% fine, okay? This one's better though. You know, if uh, this last one, I would give a grade of about like a, you know, like a, uh, I don't know, CC plus. If this one, I would give like a uh, B plus uh, uh, or A minus, okay? That's a much neater welt joint. Not a problem. Now, by the way, here's a pair of Floorsheim 93605 shell cordovan Floorsheims from the 80s. You can see that welt joint. I'd give that like a BB minus, right? You can see the welt joint. You see even a little bit of a 45 degree angle on it. Not a problem. Um, here's one that I would give this one like uh, a, yeah, I'd give this one definitely an A, barely perceptible. That's an ideal welt joint, and we wish all of them were that way, right? But they're not all going to be that nice. This one, to be honest with you, this is an A+. Plus. Other than that, that stitching there sticking up, I couldn't even tell where the welt joint was. It's barely visible there, okay? It's just behind the edge of the heel. Perfect, okay? Here's the other shoe of that same Floorsheim Shell Cordovan shoe from the 80s, okay? Or possibly 70s. I don't know the date of these shoes. That's pretty much a perfect welt joint. I'd give that an A, A minus, okay? Overlaps very nicely, skived at a 45, very neat. But it has to start somewhere. Here's another one. 
on a pair of uh, Allen Edmonds uh, from like the late, uh, like he's around 2008 to 2012. Can't even find where the thing is. That, that I'd consider that a perfect welt joint. Here too, absolutely perfect. Couldn't even really find the sucker, okay? Those are some of the things you're gonna see. Remember the welt joint. The welt joint that has to start and stop somewhere. Um, so just remember that that's not necessarily a problem, okay? So I know I didn't cover all the problems. I know a bunch of you are going to disagree. So go ahead and fire off and, you know, tell me how, you know, whatever I am in the comments below, okay? And if you're really mad at me, go to my playlist and watch every one of my videos and comment on every one of them and how bad they are, okay? Ha ha, right? Anyway, I hope this genuinely brought you some value, entertained you a little bit. And I hope that also settles you a little bit as far as, because the question I wanted to help you guys answer for some of you newer people is if I paid more, why are there problems with it? In other words, sometimes you think, well, if I paid $125 for this, you know, mediocre cheap shoe, why when I paid $300, isn't it two or three times as good? You know, in other words, why did I get flaws with a more expensive shoe? Well, short answer, it's more complicated to make and because it's made of natural materials, not artificial materials, okay? Um, so I hope that helped. If you want to see more videos like this, please go ahead to my playlist. If this brought you some value, please hit that like button. Feel free to subscribe if you like. Thank you very much, guys, and God bless.